Uh, but anyway, the, the FAA has received feedback from operators, including numerous, numerous public safety agencies, about difficulties in obtaining firmware updates to some existing models of unmanned aircraft systems and to activate standard remote identification capabilities and make them re remote identification compliant. So they heard the complaints, uh, they realized there's an issue, um, and they took action. Uh, I wish they would have took action quicker, but uh, but they, they did take action. So, you know, what are we, three days out? Um, so you, you have six months if you're waiting for your broadcast modules that you do not have to comply the rule. And as John said, that the intention is to ensure that you can still fly on behalf of public safety. If you run into an issue and you're not sure, you you know you have standard mode ID, um, or you you've got your broadcast module and, and you need to fly beyond visual line of sight, and that requires remote ID and you don't have it or whatever, then you call Kerry at the Systems Operations Support Center. And Kerry, what will you do for that? Well, being that the Systems Operations Support Center is the group to go to when you need time critical, life-saving type uh, airspace authorizations. Uh, we're going to extend that out to include any issues with remote ID. Our, our function, our purpose for being part of the waiver process is to work with first responders, law enforcement, firefighting, uh, and any other uh, entity that is uh, working inside of an airspace and they, they don't have time to submit an email to a group asking for uh, some type of a, a, whatever they're calling it these days, an exemption, a, a delay. We're still going to be those people that answer the phone 24-7, 365. So if you need to get access to an airspace, and you don't have remote ID, uh, that should be annotated in the email, but that's not going to delay you getting uh, authorization into that airspace. We're, we're just gonna track it so that we can, uh, you know, if at some point, five and a half months from now, the FAA is still uh, hearing feedback that there's not enough modules and not enough drones and, and they want to look at numbers of first responders that uh, have been operating and engaged in life-saving uh, uh, flight operations and missions. We want to be able to use that to assist you uh, in, in that situation. Uh, so it's not going to change it, but we are probably going to ask if it's not readily apparent in the form, whether you have uh, remote ID capabilities, if you have uh, an exemption letter from another group in the FAA saying that there are certain operations you don't need to use your remote ID, or if you're using a drone that does not have remote ID, we'll need that information, but, and I can't emphasize this enough, it's not going to affect your SGI when you come to the SOSC. We are always going to be there. This is our mission set. This is our commitment to working with all of you, like we've done for several years now. There's, there's no waiver in that. There is no change. There is no hesitation. We will always be there to assist you. So just to make it very clear, I think Charles has already sent out this information to everybody already, but but if for some reason you need to turn off remote ID for security reasons, that's going to have to be with legacy drones because drones built after September 16, 2022 are supposed to have standard remote ID built in, then you and you need to turn it off for whatever because you have a mission that arises. You have two things you can do. If, if you know way in advance that you want to have that ability, you can, we've sent the information where you can submit a request and they can grant you the right to turn it off in cases of, of security issues where you're afraid the bad guys will be able to track what you're doing uh, and it'll impact the safety of the public and your officers. Uh, and But it's important to realize that I've heard people say, well, I'll get that and I don't have to worry about remote ID. 
So the problem with that is it only gives you the ability to turn off remote ID for that security event. When you go back to do training or you go back to fly for an elementary school or, or you go back to film, a, uh, take pictures of a car accident, remote ID has to be on. So you ha have to have the ability to, to either turn it on and off or don't operate that drone if it can't satisfy the rule um, because, because it was a legacy drone that doesn't have remote ID built in. The second thing is if you're not, if you don't apply for that security exemption waiver, whatever we're calling it, and something arises where you need to turn off remote ID for whatever reason, Carrie, what do they do then? Well, you're gonna contact our group and you're going to uh, request that we waive that portion uh, in your SGI and we'll get that back to you as fast as we would get a, a past SGI to get into the airspace. We will annotate it, we will document it on the form, but you are going to get into that airspace. Uh, so it we don't want anyone in law enforcement or first responders to hesitate on their mission because of uh, remote ID. Eventually, uh, eventually, everybody will have remote ID, every drone, but th this, is, this is the process to get to that point. So that's our commitment. We will continue working with you and, and help you out in whatever you need to be able to uh, conduct uh, safe flight operations. And when you're speaking to those specific uh, missions we have in our blog, so those that, that haven't seen it, you can go to drone responders and go to the news blog, and you can see the examples of those types of missions that are acceptable. And the normal missions that don't have any co covert or safety issues are not going to be approved for that purpose. It's also important to remember that you have to have standard remote ID built into the aircraft in order to fly beyond visual line of sight. If you have a broadcast module on a legacy drone, and a, a emergency situation arises where you need to fly beyond visual line of sight and all you have is that broadcast module, what do they do, Carrie? You're going to come to the SOSC. You're going to request an SGI waiver. You're going to tell us uh, the, the issue, the situation, and we will get you an SGI waiver so that you can conduct your flight operations. So the only thing else I want to remind you from the official talking points from the FAA is, is to remember that when you do get broadcast module, you need to adhere it and start operating with, with remote ID. Um, and again, they, they want to make sure that everybody complies as soon as they possibly can. And in the, the talking points, they mentioned twice that after March 16, 2024, operators who do not broadcast remote ID could face fine, suspension, or revocation of pilots. So it's important when you're able to comply that you do comply. And it's important that you, if you don't comply by March 16, 2024, then you don't operate that drone uh, until you're able to comply. So that's sort of, go ahead, John. Hey, I, I think there's a little bit of confusion out there also. And, and uh, remote ID, if your drone has standard remote ID, you cannot turn it off. So it's not, there's no on and off switch like there is with, uh, ADSB. So you either have a drone that has uh, standard remote ID, and that that is non-tamperable; it can't be turned off. And then your older drones will not have remote ID. Those would have to have the broadcast module. And I, and that's what Mike's referring to when he's saying turn it on and turn it off. He's really saying you either have a broadcast module on it or you don't. So I just want to clarify that there's no turning on and off uh, remote ID. It's either on all the time or it's not equipped with it yeah and, and just to so add just on to what to you're saying that. i've talked to a couple a couple manufacturers and they don't have plans to make any changes unless there's word that changes in the rule because it's pretty clear that they're not supposed to be able to tamper yeah the rule the order. rule says only drones built or designed for the u.s government uh can be made without remote id standard so that's the way the rule's written today so you know it i know there's this is a new concept. It's a lot of confusion, uh, but your drone uh, either has it standard or you'd have to equip with a broadcast module. And what Mike's talking about is asking to be relieved of the requirement, uh, getting an authorization from the FAA to not 
equip it with that broadcast module to do those security sensitive missions. It's I know it's it's a lot. Uh, and when we say legacy drones, we're actually talking about the drones that are that are old that will not have standard remote ID built in. That you'll have to put a broadcast module in. As John said, that's the only way you can fly without remote ID is basically physically taking off the broadcast module or shielding it and then flying that aircraft. But uh, yeah, and we and we've had you know it's interesting because I, I I think Greg. Greg and I have had a little conversation about uh, labeling, for example, and uh, uh, there's also confusion about labeling. And, and the rule requires uh, drones that are designed or produced after last year that they have to have a label in there that says this is remote ID compliant. So, uh, you know, caveat emptor, if you're buying a drone, open it up and look at it and say, hey, this this doesn't have the remote ID. This is not remote ID compliant. So. Uh, and and there's, you know, some of some of you on this webinar wear two hats. You wear the hat of a designer producer, and that's governed by subpart delta D. Uh, and then some. Most of you are just operators, right? And and what we announced today applies to the operators only, which is subpart B, Bravo. So when you go to operate your drone, you're operating under part eighty nine, subpart B. Right. So the, the the stuff that came out today is for the operator. It is this it's everything that's in effect going back as far as last year still applies to the designer producers who are governed by part 89 subpart D. Uh, yeah, I know it's a lot. It's confusing. Uh, and, and this is partly why we're using discretionary enforcement, because who knows how this is all going to shake out. Right. And the. Uh, and it, it's just a complicated subject. And uh, I just wanted to clarify that, though, that, you know, you cannot, this is not like ADSB for those of you who are aviators already and know about it. You can't just turn a switch. It, your drone either has it or it doesn't. And I'm, I'm done, Mike. <laughs> so, good job, John. So we know that there's going to be a lot of questions. And so we're going to hold the questions for the FAA until the end. But I want to go ahead and have our guests give their their uh, presentations regarding what they're working on. We're going to start off with Alan from Air Sentinel, who's going to talk a little bit about a an app they're building, I think, for public safety uh, to, to to use remote ID. Alan, thanks, Michael. Hi, Ron. Nice to meet you. I'll go ahead and share my screen. So we built Air Sentinel out of the idea of aggregating data sharing data and helping first and foremost law enforcement and public safety agencies have a really effective tool to utilize remote ID. And Air Sentinel is made up of three parts. We have our cloud-based system that aggregates data from our Android app and our air monitoring stations. We also have an integrated API so we can plug in air information exchanges and capture data from other air information exchanges to further enhance the amount of data you're using. Right now, for the foreseeable future in our company's plans, any law enforcement or public safety agency can sign up and use the platform for free with as many users as they want. You can utilize the Android app, which is free, to detect any ID compliant drone on your phone. We're also about to launch an iOS version of the app that, well, iOS only allows us to utilize Bluetooth for, for detection. It will act as a real-time display for cloud aggregated data. So if you're servicing an uh, event, parade, stadium, football game, something like that, you can have an AMS station up, which will allow any officers in the area to, in real time, be able to detect and track drones and the pilots in the areas. When you sign up for an account, you're able to create watch lists for specific drones based on the serial number. So if you have a problem drone, let's say you're responsible for security at a power plant, as an example, you can track that drone and see that it pops up at other power plants or pieces of critical infrastructure and get notified when that aircraft goes in the air. You can also set up geofenced areas around areas that you want to monitor so you can get notifications when any drone goes in the air in those areas. So we built it as a really easy to use tool. Um, the only thing I would say for everyone on the Zoom today is 
if you're going to go ahead and register, register with your work email because we are getting thousands of requests for accounts. And if you're not registering with a work-related or organizational email, we're not activating accounts automatically. Um, but it's a really cool tool. I'll throw our URL in the chat so anyone that wants to check it out or register can. Um, right now, we've probably got about 90 law enforcement agencies and pretty much every federal agency in the United States is on it and multiple agencies in Europe and Canada is also using it. Um, so it's free right now for everyone, um, you know, but for public safety, we intend to keep it free for as long as we can foresee. That's it. Thanks, Alan. And uh, is the link up there for them to see you said? Yep, I put it in the chat to everyone. Good. Uh, next up, Greg is going to talk about some of the remote ID testing. Greg? Yep, thanks, Mike. Yeah, we did um, We did go out and tested eight modules, which is, at the time, that was about two weeks ago. That was pretty much all the modules that were available and approved by the FA uh, on the uh, the DOC list. Uh, we, uh, we have a Beyond Visual Line of Sight waiver, so we decided to uh, go to our little spot and then uh, flew... Uh, traditional drones that don't have remote ID built in and see how far we could actually pick up the signal using a variety of different methods, uh, mostly using iPhones and Android. Uh, we wanted to see, you know, what's the best app out there? What's the best technology? What are the limitation of the technology as far as the, uh, the, the, the beacons themselves, the modules themselves, and also the apps and the platform. Um, so uh, as a quick, uh, you know, result to what we found, uh, actually Air Sentinel, Alan, I have to say your app, along with the drone scanner app, gave us the best results. Uh, the uh, Air Sentinel app, if you're listening and you want to use it, it's only on Android at the moment. Uh, maybe Alan can talk about if there's going to be a, an iPhone version eventually, but uh, the drone scanner app is available on both platforms. Now, I do want to give a warning to iPhone users if you're uh, planning to try to find remote ID stuff using an iPhone, it's going to be a bit more difficult because of uh, some technology behind what uh, Apple allows developers to use. Uh, it's difficult or impossible, I think, to pick the Wi-Fi signal. So if the module uses Wi-Fi technology or if uh, the uh, standard remote ID drone uses Wi-Fi technology, the iPhone is not going to be able to pick it up. And so you'll be better off using an Android phone for this, which pains me to say as an Apple user. Uh, but the uh, as far as the modules, uh, we have a, we, we had quite a bit of range as far as how far we could pick up the signal. Uh, the only one that did well as far as distance, the furthest that we tracked was actually Aaron, uh, the, the Pierce Aerospace module, uh, we went as far as a mile with it from the location that we were at, which is in the middle of nowhere, Arizona. Uh, we, uh, we still had uh, barely, barely line of sight at one mile, uh, but the uh, like I said, we had the VV loss waiver. So we were able to pick that a mile away using the drone scanner app and the uh, Air Sentinel app. Uh, we weren't able to pick that up on the drone tag app on the iPhone at all. Uh, I don't know, Aaron, if it's because you guys are using Wi-Fi or not on that module, but uh, no, you're not. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I'm not sure why that, that app didn't pick it up, but the the drone scanner app actually did pick it up. I'm looking at my results. Um, otherwise, the, the other modules that we picked up range from 300 feet for uh, one of the, uh, the drone tag mini um, to close to... Let me see, like over a thousand feet for some of them, 2,500 feet for another one. Uh, but like I said, the, the Pierce was the one that went the furthest. So uh, it was really interesting to, um, to to see the results and see the limitations of the product that was receiving the signal. Uh, we also had a, a little receiver from, um, well, I'm not going to remember their name now. Um, Sentry, uh, UAS Sentry. They make a little receiver uh, that's designed to see if your module is actually working correctly. Uh, we got pretty good results with it, but once the, the signal went a little too far, it would drop off. But yeah, essentially that's what we found out. We also collected data from a survey uh, that we sent to quite a few users, uh, which we did end up sending to the FA in, a, in a, an open letter. 
uh, we found that there were quite a few people that were going to be forced into non-compliance. Uh, we were asking for the FA to move the, the enforcement, which they did. Uh, we found that about half of the users that need to have a module were going to be forced into non-compliance because of module availability, uh, having ordered a module and not received it yet, or having an update coming in December. Uh, DJI is coming up with an update uh, middle of December to update uh, the Phantom 4 Pro V2, the Mavic 2 series, so the 2 Pro and the 2 Zoom, the FPV drone. I know a lot of uh, public safety agencies are using the FPV drone, so that's going to be updated to standard remote ID uh, coming up soon, and then the Air 2 as well. Uh, the Air 2S is already approved, but the Air 2 will be approved uh, in December. So those things, if you have those in your fleet, uh, that's a uh, a good reason to tell any FA personnel that comes over and say, yep, it will be updated in December. DJI confirmed it. And uh, I'm glad that we were able to extend the deadline. And I'm going to shut up now. Thank you. And Greg, do you have uh, anything in the way of a matrix that you've done that just shows the comparisons you made when you're doing your testing? Yep, we have a uh, we have a video. I'll find a link and then I'll post it in a minute here. We uh, we posted all the results in a in a video on YouTube, and uh, you'll be able to see how we tested it, the the actual results that we got from each of the modules, and we also did a, a review of the pricing, the technology, and everything that goes along with it. And as we know, a lot of them are not available, but I think Aaron is going to talk about this a little bit more and and the reason behind it. Thanks. That's great that you're going to post that link. That's the question I was going to ask too. So. The other thing, have you heard anything about the uh, DJI Mini 2? Are they going to do standard remote ID for that? No, the Mini 2 is not on the list. I doubt that they would update it because it's still a sub-250 gram drone, which I know it needs to have remote ID if you fly under Part 107, but uh, it doesn't if you don't need, uh, if you if you fly recreationally. So uh, there, there's been a lot of chatter, quite frankly, from people in the uh, in the community being forced into having remote ID when they, by rule, don't have to. And so we, we hear people with a Mini 3 that said, well, I don't want to broadcast remote ID, but I have to because DJI made it available. And my argument to them is, yeah, that drone was designed to be over 250 grams as well. Uh, because of the battery, there's a bigger battery that goes in it. And so they had to make it by law, they had to make it compliant with remote ID. So I don't think in the future, DJI will make sub 250 drones compliant because, well, they don't have to by law, uh, but you'll have to put a module on top of it if you want to fly it. So can I get you on a phone call with my wife to help justify why I can buy a new drone? <laughs> of course. Awesome, thanks. And uh, last not but not least, I want to turn it over to Aaron Pierce, who's going to talk about some of the broadcast modules we're doing. Aaron? Yeah, thanks, Mike. Uh, much appreciated. Um, so we, our broadcast modules come out of our work with U.S. government. Um, we've been, we've got 11 U.S. government customers that we've been working with over several years now uh, with our entire flight portal ID, a remote identification system that includes receivers, apps, uh, integrations that have integrated with about, you know, north of a dozen different systems used on the federal side now, uh, and then our beacons as well. And the commercial beacon that we have, um, we announced and has been out on the market available since since May. Um, as Greg kindly mentioned and kindly tested for us that for us, um, you know, we we initially started contracting with U.S. Air Force, so we had a pretty hefty amount of um, quality control that went into that and to making sure that we could get a, a great performing beacon to work for some of those airspace security needs that they have as well as with as well as some of the other federal customers uh, that we've worked with and you know we were finally able to share just recently some of the you know domestic implementation of that with federal and local law enforcement out of the Super Bowl earlier this year um, so our, our B1 has been available um, it is still available. Um, you can pre-order them uh, or, or you can order them now. And I know there's been a lot of concern about the availability of the beacons. And what we effectively saw as a, as a beacon OEM was that we didn't really see a lot of orders coming through until really four weeks ago. And then everyone bought a beacon at the exact same time. And we sold out of our stock like that. Um, you know, every company that works in this space is a, a small business. We're not Apple, so we can't stock a million iPhones, you know, and get them prepped for a, a big keynote release. Um, so 
we have normal supply chain cadences on our side of six to eight weeks in terms of you know being able to take an order and then fulfill based upon those those batch orders. Um, but what we saw was a discrepancy between the deadline and when people were actually going to go, oh my God, this is actually real. We have to to get something to come into compliance now. Um, so we we've got a relatively robust supply chain and our you know, accepting orders and fulfilling them uh, right now in that rough six to eight week time frame. Um, with you know, we've got the next batch of orders going out next week. So um, that's a little bit of background on on some of that. Uh, any Mike, any other questions you want me to dive into regarding the actual beacons and any of the other parts of our overall ecosystem of remote ID products and services? Now, if you want to talk a little about some of the things you guys have done, including, are you guys still doing the uh, the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth antennas? Um, so everything is totally encapsulated inside of our uh, remote ID modules. So it broadcasts out on Bluetooth. Um, it's. I was actually asking about. I remember you did a you did a demonstration when we did the remote ID demonstration at Quantico years ago. You had a you built a little module that basically had a Wi-Fi antenna and a uh, I think it had Bluetooth as well, but like someone could mount around a police station or a jail that would allow them to, to detection of drones that are flying in the in that area. Are you guys, still yeah, doing that? yeah. So those are our receivers. Uh, right now we have so we've got a couple different receiver lines. Our Bluebird receiver line, which is more of the prototype pieces that we've been deploying with um, U.S. government. We have our production ones uh, coming out later this year. Um, these here, I'll, I'll share a screen here. Yeah, so these we've had out deployed in, you know, DOD environments, uh, out with DHS as well. Uh, we like, you know, we built these to be as robust as possible so that they'll work in any of your environments. It, hence the picture, you know, not a, a pretty product photo, but more of a real, you know, photo of, hey, this is out in the freezing cold up in Alaska with, uh, you know, trying to stay warm, but remote ID is working. So we've had these out working for, you know, quite some time now. Um, they live in Pelican cases. They're pretty portable. It takes about five to 15 minutes to set one up, depending upon your configuration. But what we've done is made these really modular. Um, the, the ones that come out are going to be significantly smaller than this, the ones that come out this fall. And what that allows you to do is to passively monitor your airspace for remote ID messages. And um, we have different antenna configurations for this, so that depending upon your environment, your budgets, um, what you're trying to do in that in that area, you can capture that airspace data and then route it to any type of uh, system that you need to make an integration with, uh, whether that be an app that you've got from us or whether that be some other type of common operating picture or law enforcement based system. Um, it really kind of evolved uh, from something that Mike saw a couple of years ago, which was a puny little thing into something that is uh, much more robust and oriented towards, you know, serving both a commercial purpose for integrating data into UTMs as well as integrating into counter UAS systems. Very cool. I, I, I still think this is a very interesting concept. And, you know, it, my mind, it boggles the mind sometimes in thinking what you can do with it. But you know, on the public safety market, is if we we have a defined incident perimeter, the ability to be able to set up some of these monitors and detect who's coming and who's going, and also what we used to call, say at the Department of Justice, we used to say we want to know what we don't know, and so to be able to set these kind of things up around a jail or or a prison, and say why is Mike O'Shea keep flying towards my prison, you know, over and over again, you know, is he trying to drop contraband? Is he you know conducting surveillance? You know, what is he doing? But uh, it's something to follow up on. But no, that's yeah, very interesting. Yeah, we've got models to go on the move as well if you need something in a mobile fashion. Um, and then because we've already won multiple contracts for these services and products on the U.S. government side, uh, we hold sole source justifications if anyone on the line is federal. Uh, we've got ways of, you know, working through the contracting process to try and remove as much pain from that as possible. 
So you also said, it's, how many weeks is it taking to get an order of a broadcast module typically? Right now, we're typically looking at about six to eight weeks. Uh, so two and months. So it's important if it's two months and this the, the rule goes fully effect in March, that means don't apply, a, order one in March, don't order one in February probably. Um, you should probably order one before the end of this calendar year to ensure that you have it to make sure uh, you get it before the rule is fully in effect. Um, well, you should you should have ordered today because you need to comply as soon as possible. It's yeah, issue, right. You don't. You're not postponing it's until March. I mean, I know I'm being a jerk here, but <laughs> you know details matter, right? So you should order today <laughs> so that you have because yeah. as soon as you get it, you need to equip. So, and one of the things that we do with ours is all. It's all. It's made in the United States, assembled in the United States. We need to do that for our federal customers. So you're going to get if any of your departments um, have that type of mandate as well. We can cover you there. And we flight test every single one of these beacons and sign off on it with our test pilot prior to it going out the door. Uh, we check the battery and we sign off on that as well. And all of our customer support is US based also. So if any of you need any assistance with it, you know, please let us know. And we typically have a, a tight turnaround on getting back to you. What is the uh, cost for the standard remote broadcast module? So ours is 265. Um, that's another piece that I know was a little bit of a consternation from FAA. Um, we built a product that works and has that made in USA capability. So, you know, you're going to get a little bit more of a premium because of that. But the big thing here is that this is, you know, this market didn't exist, frankly, until four weeks ago when people started to order. So it's one of those that as it continues to grow, we anticipate being able to draw pricing down based on uh, economies of scale, but I think, uh, I, I don't know, I can't speak for all of the other OEMs, but I'm fairly certain that every single one of us has that same type of constraint with building a product that will actually work. Plus this is the market that's essentially going to go out of business at a certain point, because the goal is, you know, your drone will eventually fall out of the sky that has a broadcast module, and your new drone will have standard remote ID. So, you know, so that, that is one difference that ours has as well is if an OEM wants to get a really high performing remote ID capability into their aircraft, um, we can integrate what we have into those as well, which will further drive costs down. Um, and we've seen that our beacons have exceeded the performance that is built into some of the OEMs today uh, when we've gone head to head against some of those and some of our own internal testing. Very good. Okay, so I know we've come to the end of, you know, we probably over inundated you with information. Um, you know, we've told you that we're going to conduct enforcement um, after our rented, right now we're doing discretionary, discretionary enforcement until March 16th, 2024. But again, remember that's only for FRIAs that are people waiting for their free applications to be approved and people who are in the process of ordering remote ID uh, broadcast modules and they don't currently have them. Uh, if you have standard remote ID, you should be broadcasting. If you have a broadcast module, module you, now you should comply with the, with the rule. Um, and if they contact you and you say, well, I got a broadcast module, but I decided not to stick it on because, you know, I, I thought I had until uh, March 16th. That's not the case. The, the rules for people who don't have them, um, who currently cannot put them on their drone. So it's important that you comply with the rule if you can. So I know there's probably questions, Charles. Um, you know, if we did our job right, we confused you, we befuddled you, um, and made it very difficult. To, it's, it's all for, for job security so that uh, John and I can work until our 90s um, and, and carry um, so, so that we can continue answering questions about remote ID until then. John will be 90 next year. Carrie's got two years. I've got like six years if I'm 90. Uh, hey. so I one question. Are we going to tell them about how to get an authorization? So we already provided that information to Charles, who shared it with the group. Okay. Um, so if anybody still needs that, you can get it from Charles, or you can get it from any of us at the FAA. And basically, it explains the different things that you can get. Um, you know, and and right now, obviously, if you're still waiting for your broadcast module, you do not need to submit a letter on letterhead to us uh, asking for a delay because we basically get, get a a blanket. Uh, discretionary enforcement um, while we're waiting for you to get your uh, uh, your 
broadcast module. Um, and, and I believe after um, March 16th, 2024, we will not honor requests for uh, extensions at, at this point. That, that's all I can say. At this point, we will not honor extensions for uh, not having a broadcast module, but we'll see what happens. Yeah, there was one question that wasn't answered uh, to the entire group who was addressed to Aaron. It says, why do we need a deployed antenna if remote ID is broadcasted via the web? Can't air sit on other providers see all drones across the country? Yeah, very good question. So you have to have something that's listening nearby to pick it up. And the receivers themselves outperform the capacity of a phone. Uh, a phone is limited in what is built into it, a relatively small antenna. Um, the receivers are can passively and persistently monitor a piece of airspace uh, for without you having to take a phone out, and we can route that data um, over into any of those types of any type of system that you, as a law enforcement officer or entity, are uh, monitoring for that event. And, uh, and I think we eliminated the requirement to transmit over the web uh, in the final rule. So Correct. that when people talk about the, the internet, they're thinking about the notice of proposed rulemaking, which was that in when it finally came out, was that changed? Yeah, we we will we do network our receivers, so we can pass that across uh, multiple multiple you know wh whatever network type of requirement you have. We've probably done that already with the DoD in terms of how we route data and get it into a uh, a display system. So if you need an LTE requirement, if you need, you know, point to point, some sort of dedicated private mesh network, uh, we can mesh that together and so that you can get all of the data into wherever you're looking at from those receivers. But that that is spot on. The network requirement wasn't baked into the remote ID rule. And then I just wanted to add, I put the uh, information from the updated uh, information on remote ID the sensitive missions and that kind of stuff. The link is in the chat for everyone. This is also going to be recorded, so it will be available afterwards. <clears throat> and before we end up, I just want to make sure I'm going to thank uh, Greg with Pilot Institute for being here, for sharing the information and doing the testing. Some great work there, Greg. Uh, and yeah. Aaron, uh, thanks for being here to talk about that. We also have a partnership with both Pilot Institute and Pierce Aerospace, where uh, Pilot Institute provides, I still think, the only online public safety UAS uh, COA, COA and and part 107 course. And uh, and with Pierce, we have uh, an agreement to work a work group to develop what that looks like uh, as far as collecting information for public safety. So that's going forward. And we also have a partnership with Air Sentinel. So I want to thank you all for being here. Uh, I don't think there are any other questions. Oh, wait, Let's see, we just had some pop up here. I think Greg. I do just want to say time. one thing. We had a conversation today. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. We can hear you, Mike. I don't think he can hear us. Yeah, uh, but uh, Charles, I do think Greg and Alan wanted to weigh in on the, that question. I wanted. Okay. I wanted to. I, I wanted to hear one more thing. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, Mike, go ahead. No, we can hear you, Mike. So sorry about that. I'm I'm getting a. a God dang it! My computer is <laughs> popping up. Um. Just want to tell you a little story that I heard today from uh, the National Press Photographers Association. They had a, a, a press photographer who launched a drone and it was shot down with a uh, with a beanbag rounds by the local police department. Mm -hmm. um, their story was they shot down the drone because they feared that it might be carrying some kind of um, explosive materials even though they had made contact with the reporter prior to shooting it down. Um, so obviously we have an issue with a violation of First Amendment because they have, you have freedom of press. And you also, have, and then they took the drone and seized it, even though the drone had no explosive materials on it. So then we have a violation of the Fourth Amendment. Um, and then we also have a violation of uh, 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 the, the unlawful taking of a drone under federal statute. So I just want to remind people that uh, you need to be very careful. Um, you do not have the right to take down a drone 
Only four agencies currently have that right, and they're federal. Um, and you better make sure that you somebody is doing something nefarious before you decide to take that kind of action, because I can tell you that department will soon be facing a lawsuit. And I can also tell you that the there will be an investigation more than likely conducted by the Federal Bureau of Investigation as to why they shot down an aircraft out of the sky. Um, think, folks, uh, we're smart people. You know, the first thing we do when we get into public safety is we, we say we're going to defend the Constitution. So remember, the press is protected under that First Amendment. Um, learn other amendments besides the second. And then remember the Fourth Amendment at search and seizure. You can't see something unless you have a criminal reason to do so. And if your supposed reasoning is that that drone is carrying explosives and then you find out it doesn't, I, I don't know why you would have seized it. And the other issue that made me a little scared is if you're afraid that, that a five pound drone could be carrying explosives, are you shooting down 172s? Are you shooting down 747s? Don't do that either, okay? Um, so just think. Thank you. Yeah, and then we had uh, we had Greg and Alan wanted to address the, one of the earlier questions. Mike, yeah, we're I want, on silence mode. I wanted to add because we, we've been having a lot of questions recently with people buying modules and how to register them on the drone zone. Uh, I'm assuming most people are flying under part 107 in this chat. So you'll have to go to that specific drone and edit the registration and then add the module serial number, which is on the side of the module for most of the ones we've seen, and click save. Now you can do this for free right now until December. And then after that, the FAA is going to be charging $5. Uh, they've, they've extended a grace period during which you can make the change to registration and not pay the $5. But that period ends, at least as far as I know, uh, I don't know if it's been extended, but it ends in December. So make sure that you go through your fleet you're going to need to get a module for every single one of the drones you fly under part 107 that is not already compliant. Or, 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 part, 91. or part 91. Or part, or part 91. part 91. Thank you, John. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, make sure that you uh, make sure that you do that. And uh, if you're flying recreationally, it's a little bit different, but I don't think we need to talk about this here. Okay. There was one other thing here. Alan, did you have something more to add? Yeah, I was just going to add, Charles, the, to that earlier question about RID devices being networked, and Aaron touched on this a little as well. Between some of the air exchanges, a lot of the RID platforms are able to be networked, where you can aggregate data from multiple providers that are detecting aircraft, whether they're doing you know, AMS stations like what Air Sentinel has or Pierce's detection stations and aggregate that data in real time across the cloud and also back to the mobile app. So there is a lot of flexibility in doing that. And then kind of to the point that just came up about a press drone being shot down, one of the things that law enforcement agencies can do within the Air Sentinel platform is set up pre-greenlit drones, drones that they know are trusted that are going to be in their events or areas they're monitoring they know are good and not a threat. So they can identify those drones very quickly and clearly via color coding on their map to know that those drones aren't a threat. And then we have a question. <clears throat> just want to make sure this is answered openly. It says, for those, you, for those of you still investigating which broadcast module to get, are you recommending those agencies to submit a letter of exemption until we can comply or is one not needed unless you don't think the modules will arrive until after March? Yeah, I answered that uh, in writing and I, I'll follow it up in uh, verbally, but uh, the requirement is there today. Uh, and if you, the way I look at this is if you have missions that you're going to want relief from, even after March 16th, you're going to need an, it's an, the, the verbiage that we use is authorization. You can't, uh, there's no waivers. I, I know a lot of people equate them the same, but we call it, it's an authorization. So if you have a mission that you uh, need relief from the requirement to transmit remote ID after the 16th of March, my recommendation uh, would be yes, make that request for an authorization from the FAA. Uh, and you want to get that done uh, so that you don't have to call carry, uh, you know, in the uh, SOSC for an emergency, because 
it's too late by then. You should have already been complying anyway, right? So uh, that would be my recommendation would be if you if you think you've got certain mission sets that need relief, don't wait. Yeah, I think the reality is there are choices out there. There is availability. There really isn't a, a need to wait. There's uh, no, it's, go yeah, ahead and, and control and, 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 and the policy, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, the FAA postponed it. Well, we really didn't. You know, we didn't. You got to really read that policy. And uh, uh, what we're saying is, hey, we're going to if you're trying to comply, we're not going to nail you. Right. But if you're if you're blowing it off and you're you know being very naughty, we might nail you. I mean, that's what we're saying. Right. So. Um, so, yes, I'm, I would recommend that you. You know, you think about your mission sets and think about what you're going to need. And uh, and then if you're going to need it after the 16th of March, you're going to need it. So, and then we have a question from Dirk Giles with the U.S. Forest Service. It says, will the SGI have a checkbox that is streamlined or an additional box to add verbiage through for relief? It'll mostly have a, a, a checkbox and, uh, you know, a comments box for uh, drone operators to fill out as part of the process. Okay. And then we've had a lot of people that have asked, Mike, what was that department that shut down the drone? <laughs> they wouldn't know. tell me. Okay, um, that's they're, that's they're, not good. And I, I was not good, but I was I it, it you know I'm the probably the biggest defender of public safety, but but I realize sometimes we like anybody else we do things we shouldn't do, and and so it infuriates me that you know well educated public safety agency does something like that, and I'm just like no, don't do that. I think the reinforcement is it's an aircraft and you need to follow the laws that relate to aircraft and you can't shoot down an aircraft and you can't jam it and you can't do anything else unless you're one of those federal agencies that has the and authority my, to do so. John always likes to point out the least of your worries is the FAA. Um, it's yeah. going to be the lawyers that show up with their big briefcases looking for that blank check that you're going to write. Yeah, and shooting down one of the press drones is not really a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, I think uh, all the questions have been answered. Does anybody else have any last words? I think Greg just got a question. Oh. <laughs> no, nope, I'm good. It says, will DGI update the Mavic 2 EA for remote IDs to oh. you, Greg? Uh, we it's not on the list of the of the drones they said they would update. So I'm going to say no at this stage. I don't understand why, because it's the same technology as the Mavic 2, but that's a, that's a DJI question. But as of now, it is not on the list. And then yeah, we've got take, a question. I can take Michael Thompson's question. Okay. Uh, so Michael asks, uh, it's really not a, not a law, law enforcement question, but uh, is there an option to run multiple drones on one remote ID? So that's a great question. Uh, one of the use cases that uh, is agreeable to request relief from the requirement to transmit remote ID is for drone light shows, for example. So uh, obviously it makes no sense if you're going to have 200 drones flying around that they think about what the purpose of remote ID is, right? So uh, so there are cases where uh, you might be doing a, a swarm operation, but remember that if you're doing that sort of thing, you're going to need a waiver from the FAA to do that sort of stuff. So uh, that's a complicated situation. Uh, you're not allowed to operate more than one drone without a waiver uh, under Part 107 and under Part 91. That that's not written in the code, so you're going to need a waiver to do that kind of stuff anyway. So, but for those of you who are doing drone light shows, yes, uh, we are giving them out, and uh, we are doing it for certain uh, special airworthiness certificates and experimental cat experimental categories. Uh, so we are writing. We are giving some authorization. We are providing some relief for that. Uh, you would send that to RID authorizations at FAA.gov. And uh, I think Mike's already provided, you know, you're going to need it on the letter. They may be asking whether or not they can move their remote broadcast module from one aircraft to another aircraft. Yeah. So, not, you know, uh, the short answer is no. It's a one for one. Uh, the only people who could do that would be rec flyers flying exclusively under 49 USC 44809 and be. And that's because uh, they have an inventory of aircraft that they can have multiple uh, drones under one registration number. But uh, for Part 91, so those of you flying as a public aircraft, that's under operated under Part 91, 
And those of you who operate under 107, uh, it's a one for one, one broadcast module. And now technically, could you do it? Yes, you could deregister or decouple that and then go back in and change the registration. But each registration card has to have its own remote ID serial number associated with it. So uh, it's not practical. So think about it. It's one for one for part 91 and 107 operators. Aaron, go ahead. Yeah, one question that we get asked a lot is about mounting on mounting a beacon onto drones that have visual um, collision avoidance systems on them. We were drone pilots also, and we specifically designed ours to actually fit within some of those um, some of the aircraft that have that. So if you've got specific model questions on how to mount on anything. Um, I, I listed our info at peerservicebase.net address in the in the chat. Go ahead and email that one. Um, one of our pilots on there get, gets those questions, and he can help walk through how to actually mount the beacon onto the aircraft. That's one of the most common questions we get. So just wanted to make sure that, you know, hey, we can walk you through how to do that if you have any questions along that along those lines. Okay, and then and, we got, uh, I, uh, I just want yeah follow up with Michael Thompson. So he's talking about FPV drones like racing. No, you gotta uh, you'd have to have everybody having their own because each each you're not flying ten drones by yourself. Now there are entities looking to do that, but they're going to get a waiver and go through that whole process for that. So that's a very uh, complicated one. And then Greg, to your point earlier, uh, Tom Owen says he spoke with Grant Hustica at DJI yesterday and M2E advanced remote ID software fixes in beta and should be released very soon. Uh, they ran seven of those, so they had a big concern for them. That's why they went and followed up. Okay, I think um, I think that's all the questions. Um, Mike, any last words? Yeah, just if, if you guys run into issues or you have additional questions or you don't want to ask in front of the, the group or whatever, just feel free to email us or contact us. You can contact us, me direct at michael.oshea at fa.gov. Um, John, what are you, john.mehan at fa.gov? Yeah, j-o-h-n dot mehan, m-e-e-h-a-n at fa.gov. I'll put it in the chat. Put the apostrophe in or not put the apostrophe in. It still works the same way. Or you can reach out to Charles and Charles can forward the email to us because he does that. Um, and uh, we're happy to assist, and Carrie can help too. Carrie, you're Carrie.Fleming at FA.gov, right? Yes, Michael, I am. Um, so just like he said. But... Yeah, so again, uh, as always, Mike, John, Carrie, thanks for always being here and uh, helping provide information directly from the FA and answering the questions. Uh, and for all your support behind the scenes, uh, you try to keep us on the straight and narrow so that we are safe and legal. So it's appreciated. And to to Greg, Aaron, and Alan, thank you all for being here for this kind of special edition. And it was very timely that we had this schedule for today and everything just kind of fell into place. So thank you all for being here and for what you all do as well. Thanks. That's a wrap. Thank See you all. Right. Bye, everybody.